Dr. Adam Rosen here again. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a different topic, uh, and that's the topic of hip fractures. When you have knee arthritis, you have that time and the luxury of seeking out a doctor, even getting a second opinion, and meeting someone and going through something in what we call an elective fashion. But when you fall and you break your hip, you're taken by an ambulance to a hospital, and a lot of times you're scared, you might be alone, you might be told that the doctor's coming in to see you tomorrow, you're going to have surgery tomorrow, so there's a lot of fear of the unknown. Uh, and sometimes you might not always, due to time constraints or the doctor that you see or the hospital that you're at, have time to get all of your questions answered when you're going through this. I see a lot of patients afterwards that have had surgery elsewhere that had a, have a lot of questions. And you've probably seen my other videos where when it comes to knee replacement, I do a lot of education so I'm hoping that this gives you answers to questions that you might have if you happen to sustain a hip fracture. Um, but more importantly, it may help you if you have a friend or loved one um, that goes through this kind of injury. And this is an increasing injury. So uh, in the past year or so in the United States, from when we have data, there's about 260 to 300,000 hip fractures that occur per year. They estimate by the year 2040, that there will be a, around 500,000 hip fractures a year. If you're in the UK, UK's data shows in the past year there's about 76,000 hip fractures that occur per year. And worldwide, there was a study that was done looking at what's happening in the future, and they looked at worldwide the number of hip fractures in 1990 was 1 1.6 million, and it's expected by the year 2050, which is not that far away, that there will be six 2.2 million hip fractures per year. And that's a huge, huge number. So there is a possibility that you're going to have this happen. Okay, what is a hip fracture? Well, a fracture is a break, and a break is a fracture. So don't feel that one is better or worse. More commonly, the word fracture is used as a medical term, and a layperson might use the word a break. But do not feel that one is better or worse than the other. They're the exact same thing. And when you break the hip, there can be different types of hip fractures. So when you talk to a friend, patients a lot of times don't understand why this person had this surgery and that person had that surgery, but they both had a hip fracture. So when we talk about the hip, and you'll see this picture that'll pop up here, but think about the hip as a ball and your thigh bone. And between the ball and the thigh bone are two structures called the neck and the trochanteric region, what we call the inner troch or greater and lesser trochanter. So this is sort of the, the angular sort of apex between the neck and the shaft, and then above the neck is the ball. So more commonly, people will break the neck, what we call a femoral neck fracture. It is a hip fracture. And those fractures typically are treated either with screws, where we put screws across the fracture site to hold this together. And they're screws that look just like this. So they have threads that can bind the fracture and they pull it together. And that would be if the fracture is fairly well lined up. And then we're talking today about older patients. This is not trauma. This is not the 20 year old that crashes their motorcycle. There's some different things in that category, but we're talking about fragility fractures, fractures in people that are older or have osteoporosis. So we can put screws across. That's what's called closed reduction percutaneous pinning, or you might hear a pinning. The other option is if the neck is broken and the ball is broken off, sometimes we can't repair it and get it to heal. So you can do what's called a partial hip replacement or a hemiarthroplasty. Now this is a quite old implant. This isn't commonly used anymore. It's one piece. There's a ball, which takes the place of your ball, attached to a stem. Nowadays, uh, most implants are what we call modular. So there's a separate stem that can either get cemented in the bone or press fit in the bone, meaning squeezed in and the bone has to grow into it. And instead of a smaller ball like this, which is used for a hip replacement, there would be a larger ball like this, typically made of metal, that is the size of your ball. So we're removing the fracture, removing the ball, putting in a stem, and on top of that, a ball. This gets rid of the fracture and the ball goes into your socket so you can stand and walk. The other option is a full hip replacement where we're replacing the entire hip socket with a stem, a ball, and a cup and a liner. And the way that I describe that to a lot of my patients is if you imagine taking a tennis ball and a racquetball in half, 
if you put the tennis ball inside the socket once it's cleaned out, the yellow is roughened metal. That is what the bone will bond to. And then the, the blue half of the racquetball would stick inside the half of the tennis ball. And that would act as your new socket. It's plastic. And this is what the ball would ride on. And that would be more for a younger patient, a uh, patient that already has arthritis. And that would be determined based on a lot of factors. That's the discussion that you have with your surgeon. The next kind of fracture, a little bit lower down, is between the greater and lesser trochanter. So this is that junction between the neck and the shaft. And this is called an intertrochanteric hip fracture. And typically what we'll use there is a plate and screw device. So it's a plate that goes on the side of the bone with a number of screws that help squeeze that together. Or another device called an intramedullary hip screw. So this is basically a rod that goes inside. This is a short style that goes in to skewer the bone and the fracture. This is a long style. So what would happen is this would get cannulated inside. Think of your bone as like a hollow tube. This would go inside the actual thigh bone shaft. And it has these holes that then allow for a pin or a screw to get placed through and basically shish kebab the fracture to hold it together to allow it to heal. This is also used if someone has a lower fracture called a subtrochanteric hip fracture. And then another sort of subtroch fracture is what's called an atypical fracture. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. This is seen in patients that are on medicines, what we call bisphosphonates, that are used for osteoporosis. And it's a very non-typical fracture, which is why it's called an atypical fracture. And this is a fracture where this type of device is commonly used. So just understand that what type of fracture you have determines the best treatment option surgically. I have patients that will come in and say, you know, I went somewhere, I broke my hip, and they put pins in, but now I have arthritis. Why didn't they just do a hip replacement? Or I had an inner troke and they put a, a nail in. Why didn't they just do a hip replacement? And sometimes the fracture that you have, that surgery isn't the best surgery to put the fracture back together. Um, so we, we always pick the type of implant based on the pattern. And be honest with your surgeon. I, was, I would never feel um, uncomfortable if a patient asked me, how many of these do you do? Are you comfortable doing this type of surgery? Where we are, um, we have a lot of different orthopedic surgeons and we have very subspecialty little niches. So if I have a partner that doesn't commonly do hip replacements and they have a patient with a fracture who needs a hip replacement, I typically would get a phone call or one of my partners that does hip and knee replacements and we would be asked to see the patient. Just as if I had someone who had a shattered wrist, I might call one of my hand surgeons and say, this is more up your alley. You do this every day. The patient is in the best hands with you. So don't be afraid to ask your surgeon if he or she is comfortable doing this surgery. They shouldn't feel uncomfortable telling you yes or no, and if they say no, then you ask for one of their partners or a second opinion, someone in that hospital setting that does this surgery on a more frequent basis. Uh, now, you have to understand this is a serious issue if you get admitted to the hospital. I hear patients sometimes, and I sit down at the bedside and talk to them, that you have to understand this is a serious injury that you have been admitted to the hospital for. And this is the scary part of the discussion. This is something that you need to hear and, and understand because if you were admitted with a heart attack, most people understand this is a serious issue and you might die because you had a heart attack. So you have to understand that because you were admitted to the hospital with a hip fracture, it's an organ system failure. Your musculoskeletal system has failed. And if that has failed, sometimes it will lead to other complications and there is a chance of dying. This is the scary part that studies in the United States show four to five percent. So four or five percent, four or five out of a hundred people admitted to the hospital with a hip fracture will die in the hospital. And it's typically not from the broken bone. It's they have a broken bone, there's stress, trauma, surgery, and they have a stroke or a heart attack or a blood clot, pneumonia. There's some other issue that usually causes the fatal issues that can arise. And it's also important to understand that even in the first year, so if you broke your hip today, within a year from today, 24, 25% of people will die because of that injury that they had. So a hip fracture is a serious disease. The other thing to understand is that there are long-term consequences. 
So if you were admitted with a stroke, most people understand there's a possibility that you might have issues the rest of your life because of the stroke. So when people have a hip fracture, most people, not all, most people will lose a function grade, meaning if you're an everyday walker, normal person, and you break your hip and have surgery, there is a chance that you will need a cane the rest of your life. And if you use a cane already and then tripped and fell and broke your hip, you may need a walker the rest of your life. And if you were already requiring a walker to get around and you fell and broke your hip, there's a chance that you may need a wheelchair for the rest of your life. And I'll have patients that say, not me. Great. I love overachievers. I love people that break the rules. So it is possible to get off of those things. But when you compare yourself to your friend who had a hip replacement for arthritis and their recovery is faster and quicker and they're off of their walker and cane quicker, this is a different injury. They didn't fall. They didn't break the bone. They didn't cause trauma to the tissues, the muscles, the tendons, be admitted to a hospital emergency. Um, so there's a lot more trauma stress that goes on in the body. There's a lot more trauma that occurs at the region of the hip. And the recovery is different, even though the surgery may be the same. So you have to understand that going in. Um, but again, if you get up and move, that's fine. Sometimes it's not a functional thing with the bone or weakness. I have a lot of patients that are just afraid. There's a lot of patients that if they were using a cane, they fell, they get comfortable with the walker and they'll say, I don't need it because of pain. I just feel safer having the walker with me. And that is okay too, if they're comfortable with that. Some people like the cane. They don't use it every step, but carrying it with them gives them the confidence that they may not fall again. So you just have to understand that going in. Now, next, we're going to talk about risks and complications. So every doctor that you talk to when you have surgery should go through all of these risks and complications with you. And you have to understand there are certain things that occur with certain surgeries. So most surgeries, there's a risk of infection. So you do get antibiotics before and after surgery. There's a risk of blood clots, either in your leg or your lung. So there'll be treatments to help prevent blood clots from forming. When you break a bone, the bone can not heal. It's called a non-union. We want it to heal called a union. It might heal crooked. So if it starts to settle and shift and move, it may still heal, but now it's crooked. We call it a malunion. It may heal, but take longer than normal to heal, which is called a delayed union. Because you're having metal put in, sometimes the metal can break. If the bone's not healing quick enough, the metal can fail and fatigue, we call it hardware failure. And sometimes just because the hardware is in there, you know, commonly we'll see with screws that if they're up against the bone, but then over time the fracture settles and the screw pushes out, the screw tip may be prominent on the side. And that, that can be a complication of the hardware, sensitivity to the hardware. If you didn't have a hip replacement, if we tried to preserve the ball, like if you had a femoral neck fracture or an intertrochanteric fracture or a subtrochanteric fracture, where you had something like this put in, your ball is still there, you can develop arthritis. So if you develop arthritis, you may need another surgery where that stuff is taken out. And then we put a new um, hip replacement in. The other thing that can occur is when you break the ball, the blood supply can get compromised. We call that avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis where the ball dies and collapses. And again, the treatment is removing the hardware and putting in a hip replacement. If you have a hip replacement or a partial hip replacement, there's a risk of the ball popping out of the socket called a dislocation. If you have any surgery in this area, there's a chance of a leg length discrepancy. More commonly, if you have a fracture, as the fracture settles, the leg can get shorter. And one of the risks with a hip replacement is legs can be shorter or longer, especially in the setting of a hip fracture, because we don't really know where your hip was when it began. We assume it was like the other side, but sometimes because of getting the hip stable is difficult, sometimes the hip may need to be made longer on purpose. You can injure nerves, you can injure blood vessels, um, you can have medical complications. So this is the stress trauma that occurs with hip fractures that you can have a stroke, you can have a heart attack, you can develop pneumonia, you can have kidney failure, you can have stomach issues, especially when it slows down, called an ileus. You can have bleeding issues, you may need a transfusion. So there's a whole laundry list of stuff and there, you, because of your medical issues, may have more issues, so your doctor will talk to you about that. But again, all scary things but things that I think all patients should be aware of, especially when you're admitted to the hospital with a hip fracture.
So we talked about outcomes as far as the, the fracture healing and things like that and losing a function grade. The thing that you have to understand is for many people, this is a one-year recovery. So even if your friend had a hip replacement and is back to playing tennis and golf in two or three months, this is a different injury. And if I see people back, I'm just reiterating to them at three months and six months, if they're painful, sore, weak, that some people may see improvements for up to a year. So you have to just give it time. And again, we talked about the loss of a function grade. Again, we talked about that fear of falling and balance issues can be off. Um, and we talked about the needs for further surgery. So they're all things that I reiterate to my patients that these are normal expectations that a lot of people go through. So some things may happen down the road, and that is a result of your fall and your hip fracture. Now, the other important thing is when anybody falls and breaks something, um, from a standing height, we call it a fragility fracture. So if you fall and break your hip, if you fall and break your wrist, if you're walking and break your spine, we are worried about your bone health. We talked about the bone system as an organ system, a musculoskeletal system, and it can fail. So we want to make sure that it's not going to fail again. This is where you might get referred to a bone health division or a rheumatologist, an endocrinologist. Sometimes the orthopedic department may take care of this, but we want to make sure that your vitamin D level is normal. And if it's low, it needs to be supplemented. So you may be asked to take either a prescription level dose of vitamin D or an over-the-counter dose. The dose may depend on you and your health and what your vitamin D level is. If your bone density is low, because you'll also get prescribed a bone density test called a DEXA scan. If your bone density shows that you have osteoporosis, your doctor may talk to you about different medications that can be used to help prevent further bone loss and in some cases improve your bone density. The other important thing that you have to be aware of, and we talked briefly about this before, atypical fractures, more commonly seen with drugs called bisphosphonates. These are a medicine that has been around for a while to treat osteoporosis, and it was sort of felt that when you went on this, you went on this for life. And we now know that when people are on it for too long, it can change the bone and make it more brittle in certain ways that can lead to these strange fractures. So talk to your doctor, and if you've been on these medications for a number of years, Sometimes it's important to go off of it for a holiday and then reassess your bone density and then decide if there's a need to put you back on that drug or a different drug. And the other important thing is assessing your balance. You might need balance training, assessing your strength, and also looking at your house. Do you have throw rugs? Do you have cords? Are there things that made you trip or fall that put you at risk? You know, how is your vision? Do you have stairs? Do they have a railing? When you go out, is the, is there good lighting so you don't trip and fall? These are all things that may help prevent another injury because we hate to see someone fall, break their hip, and then six months later fall and break their wrist or break their other hip. So again, a whole lot of information. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you have this as a resource. So if you're sitting in a hospital scared because that's normal uh, because you broke your hip and they tell you that the doctor is going to be in tomorrow and you might have surgery tomorrow and you're wondering, What's going on? What am I expecting? What's going What's going to happen to me? Or maybe your mom or dad are in the hospital and you get a phone call from out of town and you're trying to figure out what they're going to go through because you haven't heard from the hospital or the doctor yet. This is just a way to kind of let you know some of the scary information, but this is just real life information of what the person is going through when you have a hip fracture. What are the risks and complications? What are the expectations as far as how long the recovery will be? and what type of fracture you have it, and how it determines what type of surgery you may be recommended. And most importantly, because this part, the last part, you can start now before you break your hip, is if you do not know if you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, if you've not had a bone density test, talk to your primary care doctor. If you don't know if your vitamin D level is low, talk to your primary care doctor and get a vitamin D level checked because if your bone health is weak, you might strengthen that now. So if you fall, your bone might be strong enough that it doesn't break and you don't sustain a hip fracture, which is actually the best medicine. So thanks again for listening. I'm Adam Rosen. Until next time, stay safe. Mm -hmm.